Hey everybody, I have a video here for you today. Now I said a long time ago I'm going to keep the memory of John Anthony West alive. I'm working on about three different Egypt videos and two of those will fall under my most mysterious sites in Egypt video. But the place we're going to go down today and John Anthony West is going to give us a tour. But this is one of the most fascinating places and one of the best places you can go to learn about Egyptian symbolism and hieroglyphs and how they told stories. We are going to go down to Dendera, the ancient Hathor temple of Dendera here. And John Anthony West is going to lead a tour, and this is a video I will leave the full links to, one that uh, my friend Carlos has let me use. But the story is here. This was kind of rebuilt during the Old Kingdom, and then all the way through the Roman period. This place has just been added onto, and smaller temples have been added right outside nearby. Let's just talk a little bit about Hathor. Depicted as a cow with the sun disk between the horns, that is a very old symbol in Egypt, and there is evidence of that going back to the proto and pre dynastic periods. But the name in the old language, Het Hurt for Hathor, uh, that means the house above the region of the sky or heaven. And another form of it means Het Haru. And that is attached to Hathor, and that means the house of Horus. And this is a region of the sky, and it shows that she was a personification of the house in which Horus, the sun god, dwelt in. Now here we have one really cool depiction at Dendera. Here is Hathor, and in depictions of Hathor, and I know John Anthony West goes over that in the video, they say this is in the depiction of a uterus, Hathor's head here, and the ears, the way it is shaped. But the four depictions of Hathor here represent the four cardinal points of the universe, and it's kind of all about creation. And Hathor is also connected to Sothis, or Sirius, here depicted as the cow with the star of Sirius between the horns here. Here is Orion, of course, leading the way. Sahu is the term written above here, so this is the soul leading the way in Orion, or as Osiris, as Orion. It says here seasonal festivals were held here, including New Year's festivals, including the child in his nest or the child in his cradle on December 25th. It says that festival, which is another name for the new sun of the new year, a common festival. And here is this famous scene right here, and people have asked what this says on top here. But it's all about this guy here, and he is Har Sema Tawe, or Horasumptus to the Greeks. And he is all about creation here, an aspect of Hathor, definitely connected to Hathor here in a very uh, important way. This is the aspect of the god, but here we have the lotus flower that the god is springing from. And it's all about creation. The lotus flower is the first thing that springs from the primordial ocean. But the text above say, The god, Har Sematawe, the great, who resides in Dendera, who is in the arms of the princes in the night solar bark, the noble snake, whose statue is carried by He, whose Ka carries his perfection in holiness, because of the Ba, happening in the sky, whose shape is admired by admirers, who comes as unique enveloped by his serpents with numerous names in the land of Atum, the father of the gods, who created everything, gold, metal, height, four hands. So this is all about a creative process, and they have festivals here of the new year. But this is the god Har Sema Tawe, and whose Ka carries his perfection, enveloped by serpents with numerous names in the land of Atum, who created everything. This is a story of creation here. And here is that god Har Sema Tawe, or Horasumptus to the Greeks, being born out of the lotus flower. And I think this is at the temple of Edfu, and here is Hathor. She wears a lot of different crowns, and they kind of signify 
where she is wor worshipped or what she is signifying in her worship. But the Jed Pillar is one of the most standard objects and the most ancient objects in all of Egypt. And this whole story is explained through thousands of years of Egyptian iconography. There is no hint of anything electrical here. This is all a standard story of creation. But let's get to the tour here. This comes from my friend Carlos's channel. This video is an hour and 13 minutes long. And a lot of my longtime viewers are familiar with Carlos's channel. But for new subs, he just has tours with John Anthony West. And some of the most famous sites in Egypt and Carlos's channel is really a gift to us all. But here is about a half hour of John Anthony West in the Temple of Hathor. And here is the glyph I was talking about in one of my uh, Anubis videos from not too long ago. The sky glyph and then the gate, the gates of heaven here. But this place, if you want to learn about Egypt, there is no better place to go than this place as far as looking at scenes from long ago and even all the way up through the Greco-Roman times. But let's just get to the tour here. Here's John Anthony West. Hope you enjoy it and you all have a very nice day. Power over your enemies. But anyway, and, and you see that certain of the, of the columns are much more heavily scooped out than others. Presumably, that was the column that did the work. I don't know. I, mean, I wasn't there at the time, but a lot of scoops went into, into producing those. You see the Hathor heads here. Um, all defaced, um, very carefully defaced, and as I said, Hathor as the, as the cosmic feminine merits, for whatever reason, the column all to herself, but none of the gods do. And she, she's in the form of the column, actually, and we'll see even more so when we go to Hatshepsut tomorrow. The column is in the form of an instrument called a sistrum, and the top of the column over Hathor's head is the is the resonating part of the instrument it's kind of a rattle sort of like maracas but with um with with uh, metal bangles there that goes um that is used um that is often used in sort of celebrating childbirth and, and that sort of thing and when we get and i think i mentioned this before i'm not sure if i did i was always puzzled by that triangular face with the cow's ears. Sometimes she's shown entirely as a cow. And then there was one, when you, there's one particular um, festival hall here. We'll, we'll, we'll go to it. And opposite it are some, a few Hathor faces that are almost left intact. A couple of little dabs were basically intact. And one of the women who was on the group, who was in the group with me, was actually the mother of triplets, so which you know something about childbirth and she, she it was she who said hey John the shape of her face is that of a uterus and then I went out the next day and got a book of an Egyptian medicine and it showed that and there is this association with the cow so but I mean you didn't need a uterus for that because as the, as the provider of cosmic nourishment a cow would be fine in and, in and of itself it doesn't have to go any any deeper or more esoteric than that but interestingly enough, when I got that book on, a, on Egyptian medicine, it showed a schematic of a uterus, but not a pregnant uterus, a, a, a regular uterus, which looked exactly, but exactly like a cow's skull. You, know, you see all over Western movies, all over the place. And I had a friend who was a doctor, and I said, well, what does a, you know, a pregnant uterus look like? Because Hathor's name, Hethor, means the house or the, or the domicile of Horus. And so he found some pictures of the doctor, and sure enough, it really looked like the face of Hathor. And then somebody else noticed the eggs and the ears as ovaries. So it's formal. I mean, there's no argument about that. And even recently, there was, there was some... If you look up, you see that and this, all of these walls, the columns, <coughs> have, all been, have all been cleaned off. And you see the color up there, the blue, and there would have been more gold there. But before, if you look at the middle aisle, you can see it from here. See in the center? Yeah. They've left it as it was, just to show you the difference between what it was and what it is now. Absolutely pitch black from smoke of countless, countless people building fires here. And what this ceiling is, this is the entirety of this, of this hypostyle hall, 
is a it's a it's a symbolic planetarium. It's a, it's a totality of the sky over here. You can see you can see if you find one of the constellations, you see here right over my head is Leo, and you go through this is half the zodiac, and the the aisle on the other side, in the, at the far to the far left, is the other half of the zodiac. So that's the zodiacal sky, and in the the second the second um, ceiling is the the weeks of the year, the 36 decan weeks of the year. So that's the the solar sky, and then the next one is the phases of the moon, the lunar sky, or the what you might say the Earth sky. So the whole thing is a um, is a planetarium, and the, the astronomers. Oddly enough, even before Champollion decoded the hieroglyphs, the astronomers knew what the Egyptians were saying because they didn't need the hieroglyphs. The figures were all familiar to them from Greek astronomy, so they, they, they knew to a large extent the extent of, of Egyptian astronomy and what they were interested in, but it's gotten much improved since then, actually. The work of, of my pal, Sally Herzer, and a few others are proving that they really not only did they know the procession of the equinoxes, but they knew they knew all kinds of how to reconcile the cycles and all sorts of things that they're not given not given credit for. I mean, and a good example is one of the classic textbooks on Egyptian astronomy by a, a guy called Neugebauer, Nug Neugebauer, German, and Parker. I forget the title of the book, but he's talking about it. He's putting down Egyptian astronomy and saying, he said, uh, modern ancient science was the product. A very few men, um, and just, just none of them happen to be Egyptian, as we've seen in the temples we're looking at. This I will use this, and <laughs> that's something that I'm, I'm going to be writing sometime soon. Anyway, let, let us continue round. Um, yeah, here they, they did a they did a clever thing. Actually, it's rather cool. They they left half the aisle, half the, the of the ceiling untouched so that you could see what it looked like before they started cleaning. And again, the number symbolism imposes itself. There are 10, there are 10, um, you'll see the vultures interspersed, alternating with, um, with um, winged discs, which are the eye of Horus. So the one that's masculine and the vulture is feminine, and the numbers are significant. There are 10, there are 10, um, Solar discs, the number of Horus, and 11 vultures, number of sky goddess of Hathor, and so on. And also here, an interesting uh, lesson in facing. If you look at this wall here, the right-hand wall, you see that absolutely everything has been completely effaced, except in a few instances, the headdresses. Why that is, I have absolutely no idea. But in this wall over here, you see that the bottom registers have been effaced, and the, the upper ones have been left entirely intact. So, unless it's, you know, unless it's, a, in Abidos, unless it's the effacers' union suddenly deciding that they don't want to go up any higher, believe it or not, the Egyptologists actually say the reason that they left them is because it was too high. It didn't have a ladder. <laughs> and I mean, there's. there's it got too high on that side. It's <laughs> <laughs> really... They ran the rocks to stack up, right? It's really nice. And I found an interesting room back there with a ladder into it. Yeah. I was very back there with my pal who's a photographer. And around the side, we were... There was a guy up on a ladder. He just saw us up on the ladder. And I, I got talking to him, and it turned out he was um, a man named Francois Domas who was a French Egyptologist who was working at the same time that Trawler was here, and one of the really astute ones who'd written very, very interesting books on, on Egyptian mythology and cosmology. And we got talking, and when he knew I was doing a book on Trawler, which is often dangerous to talk about among these guys, but he was very enthusiastic. He was asking about Lucy, and he was here at the time when Trawler was here. And some of those people were personally friendly with Trawler, but for so professional reasons could never admit it, at least in those days. And I got talking, I was working on this whole idea of, I was already working on the selective effacement, and I was talking to him about it, 
And all of a sudden, he lit up because he was working on a huge, on a massive text. And in the text, it was very, the text was almost entirely intact, except for selected little hieroglyphs of the set animal and the crocodile. And what, when we, well, well keep the, the lesson that's implicit in that, but when we get to um, where the, uh, to Edfu. But anyway, he got very, he, because it was quite clear once I pointed it out that this was, that this was deliberate and it had to be only the priests would know to do this. It couldn't be, you know, the Christians coming in and blasting everything as Christians are apt to do. And then we got talking more and he came, showed me into the hyperstyle hall here and he said, well, you know, maybe you have some ideas about something that's been puzzling me. And he said, why is it that in this temple that's entirely made of sandstone, except for a few blocks of limestone down in the crypt, there are these granite drums at the base of the columns, rough, rough granite drums that have not been finished. And I didn't, I didn't know, I mean, I said, for some reason, granite, I said, you know, there's the symbolism to the stone, and that's a fire stone, why, why that's here in this particular hypostyle hall, and, and no structural reason why it's there. And I, I, I didn't know, and then at some point, I don't know when it was, but I was made aware of a, a, a very interesting myth. Egyptian myth in which, in which Ra is, and this is, it's, an, it's, it's, got, it's an astronomical myth actually, in which Ra is, is not being sort of like the, the thing I read from the Hermetica, men are no longer being reverential toward Ra, and Ra is old and weary. Whenever you hear that, that, that shows up in symbolism, like Ragnarok, which is the death of the gods in uh, and Goethe Dummerung, uh, the twilight of the gods in Wagner. Um, it's astronomical. It's the end of, at the end of a cycle. The gods, and certain, certain of them, are, are no longer, the cycle is coming to end. So the gods that are, let's say, involved in that cycle are weary and old. <laughs> That's a pretty good line. line. And I think basically this is what the, the, what the priests are doing here. They're not recognizing the Ptolemaic Pharaoh. I mean, they did so, they tolerated. Ooh, mouse. Oh, this is the temple of the mouse. <laughs> a happy little mouse. Anyway, um, so I think, that's, I think that's what the significance of those empty cartouches are, is. Sometimes it'll just say, Pharaoh which means pharaoh, without him being any specific pharaoh. But anyway, it's a, it's a visual feature. Up here, the ceiling is very interesting. There's a lot in it. Remember I said Nut the sky is feminine. So here you see, and there's a, a parallel. There's a sister brother temple. There's a room like this, but different, in Edfu that we'll go to. But this one, that one's pretty, pretty ruined. And this one is in pretty good shape. You see Nut stretched across the sky, right, with her arms down there. And you see that her dress is made up of water. That's the water, but that's the primeval water. In other words, she's the, she's the celestial, primordial wave form that's producing the, the, you know, the manifesting the universe. And you see up there, she's swallowing the sun by night. And there, by day, she's giving birth to the sun, which you see is streaming down, not in rays, like the way that you give a kid and say, draw a sun ray, to draw a straight line. And in fact, Akhenaten did that, straight lines with hands on the end. But here, they're in streams of papyrus flowers. Now, that's by no means obvious. And I think what the Egyptians are telling us is that they know that light comes in quanta. Um, that it comes, that it comes in little packets, um, and in, in this case, it's papyrus flowers, which represent <coughs> symbolize organic, the organic world. So a, it's a very rich symbol, and it's raining down on on the facade of the temple itself. You see that face of Hathor, and over over there, the face of the temple itself is representing is replacing what would otherwise be a sun disk between the twin peaks of the horizon, uh, which we've spoken about, which is a waveform again, and out of which is growing a tree, organic life, and another tree on the other side, organic life. 
and you see the sky is all covered <coughs> filled with stars who are always five pointed. I'll talk more about that at some other point, but it's it's a very it's a very elegant and um, it's a very elegant and rich uh, symbolic relief, in fact. And especially the business I bet if you counted up the the papyrus flowers, you get some significant number. Let's see, how many rays are there? One, two, five, six, seven, eight. I think I get nine. Do I get nine? Eight, nine or ten? Yeah. Hmm? Nine. Nine, isn't it? Nine. That's no accident. And I bet if you counted them up, it wouldn't surprise me if you got 360 or 365, something like that. Anyway, that's Festival Hall. Now let's go to the fifth. You can just fit down in there, and it's really a low bridge. I mean, no kidding, you have to fall down into there. So, but once you're, you're there, there, once you're there, you stand. It's mm -hmm. a stand and there is light. Interesting why down there were kept sort of the sacred paraphernalia. And I always used to wonder why on earth would you keep wow. stuff that's supposed to come out once a year and go through the temple and all the way up the staircase and then be exposed to the crowd cheering behind. I mean, that, that was the New Year celebration. It's sort of like the forerunner of the bouncing ball in, 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 in Times Square. And I always wondered why there was this unbelievable, unnecessary, narrow thing that you had to crawl through in order to get to where this, the, the statue is gathered. And in one of, one of the trips, hey, let's move in and stay on. And so, um, so somebody said, one of, my, one of the people on my trip said, well, it's the place where it's the womb of time, it's where the you know, where the new year is born, and that's the birth canal, mm -hmm. where the statue is going to come out of. Mm -hmm. And suddenly so I said, ah, well, because, wait, you'll see, you have to really work to get through there. Mm -hmm. You won't, because you will. But, mm -hmm. but really, it's the big, tall guys, you're gonna, you'll get through, but, but it's, it's, it's a stretch. And anyhow, once you get in there, you go to the left, left. and on one wall, you'll see opposing what the, what the unicorns call the cathode ray tube. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and on one wall, it's the wall to your left. What it really is is two stages of cosmology. And it shows a lotus. Um, it shows a lotus that is emitting a water snake, a waveform. According to Schaller, the waveform represents, I mean, the serpent has multiple, <coughs> multiple functions. But when it's a water snake with a waveform, that's that's the first vibe, the the primordial vibe, excuse me, vibration, and then around which it's emitting this serpent in a kind of an envelope that looks like an aubergine, it looks like an eggplant, and that's the New Ages think that's the that's the cathode ray tube, but it's all of this is being emitted by the lotus, and on the other side is a, another variation of exactly the same thing, and that's what tells you that it isn't a cathode ray tube. The <coughs> what it is, is, again, it's, it's, car, it's when you know, when you know even a little bit, and you know to look at, um, a, uh, at, at the symbolism as if it were a car, as, as if it were a cartoon, the lotus grows, we've, I've talked about this already, the lotus grows with its roots in, in, the, in the mud, it grows through the water, in other words, earth, goes through the water, water element. It flowers in the air, um, and, and then emits its sort of mildly hallucinogenic perfume into the air, in other words, which is spirit. But if you're a cartoonist, then you have to draw a smell. How do you do it? A cartoonist does a balloon, like the way the, cartoon, the, the cartoonist draws dialogue in, in, a, in a balloon, and I'm, I'm quite certain that what, what the cathode ray tube is, is the envelope of fragrance, and you know that it isn't the cathode ray tube, because on the facing wall, if you look carefully, you see there's a similar scene, except it's not quite the same. In the first scene, there's a character who is supporting, has arms up like this, and he's supporting, I forget exactly which is which, but he's supporting the envelope of fragrance, 
And then the next one, on the other side, his, his arms are supporting the vibration of the water snake itself. And then again, you're looking closely, just down from, from where the, the lotus, this, 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 um, this scene is playing out, you'll see on one wall, it's on this wall, you'll see a falcon resting on a, on a kind of a, a plinth, on a base, on a base. And the falcon is entirely left rough, undressed, except for its, its, its divine headdress. On the other wall, on the, the, the second one, and also there's another serpent there that's, that's left rough, unfinished. On the left side, and then when you go to the right side, the serpent has the tails, it has scales on it, and this falcon is now standing and is fully feathered, except for the foot, which is left roughly dressed, and the headdress is left rough. Well, what this is telling us is that, is that it's two stages of a process. And also there are two envelopes of fragrance here, so it's, it's, the, it's the basis, and there's a big long text, which I can't read, at Ptolemaic, and if I could find, if I could find that, uh, I'm sure, and it probably exists, a translation of that text, I could probably quite easily schwallerize it and make a fairly elaborate sense of the whole procedure, but it's cosmology, it's not a cathode ray tube, and it's step one and step two of a cosmic process. And it's
No problem. Look at this one because you're missing. Well, I know, but I can't get behind it when you flip it around and I can get you. Oh, you want to do Yeah, but there's, there's one like this outside with yeah. color. Yeah. So everyone sees this one. This is the one. These colors. Uh, this yeah. is the one you see in the videos. Uh, yes. Wait, wait, wait. Yeah. But this one, there's like that, two like that, and with the color outside. All right. Here, we'll take some get real cameras. Coming. This way, you know what you want to see? I'm done. There's cancer, starting a cancer. What the devil is who hit the plot on this? Oh, she. Is this there? The other side. Go the other yeah, direction. Oh, there now, one more. Yeah. One more. Yeah. And one more is Tara. There's, one, there's no one more. I guess there she is. Is that her? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. There she is. <clears throat> so, Tara represents the center, the axis of the universe. And then the, and then the zodiac starts, see, in Cancer, because that's when the Egyptian New Year starts. And then it goes it, it, very strangely, because it goes in a kind of a spiral, but not really. Here's Cancer, and here's Leo, and where's Virgo should follow. I can't really make it out exactly. Maybe, is that Virgo? I think she's down behind the lion sitting. Like behind the lion, is that her right there? Is it? I don't know. I don't know either, but it's, it's weird. It's not, it's not in a circle, it's in a spiral for reasons I don't know. And there are certain of the figures, Charlotte points out, around in relation to the way that the zodiac is done, that Charlotte says calls attention to about half a processional age earlier. In other words, the, 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 the representation is valid for something like 1500 or 2000 BC, not for 60 or 50 BC when the, when the thing is built. Other instances that are really weird is um, on the, around the edge, I think it's wait, where's the edge? Oh, the, here, the guys are holding up these. All of these figures are holding up the entire zodiac. Oh yeah, and around the edge here go the 36 um, weeks of the year. But they're not even. They're they're uneven. They're, they're clustered together and then they're spaced out. So these are big mysteries, and all kinds of people have had a go at. You know, there they are around there have had a go at trying to figure out what, if, if anything, is responsible for the, you know, for the configuration of, of the zodiac, because it's not just the zodiac, there's a message in it somewhere or another, and some people are looking for prophecies and all sorts of things of that oh. sort. I'm in, <clears throat> in no position to <coughs> improve upon any of the suggestions. My guess is that it's not a prophecy, but it does have an ast astronomical message that I can't, that's that beyond my powers to decode, probably, or maybe, somebody who really knew their astronomy a lot better than I do, which is almost anybody, um, might be, be able to make some sort of sense out of it. 
they had enough time, um, I'll leave that to one of those bright PhD students to come, uh, who get bored with doing Tutankhamun, looking into the details of Tutankhamun's laundry list and decides to do something rather more valuable. Um, 